that. <clears throat> so I want to start off talking about what I, I presented last night just as the foundation, and then we're going to go into um, really starting to feel on a deeper level within our bodies. And then um, towards the end of the day, we're going to really work with your interaction from a, an embodied place with a client, and we're going to actually do some practicing. <clears throat> so these are some basic concepts. Um, first of all, embodiment is just another way of saying mindfulness in the body. At one point people were calling it um, bodyfulness, but it's a very awkward kind of term. But really, what embodiment is, it's mindfulness in the body. It's embodiment is to the physical structure as mindfulness is to thought. When we are fully aware in our body, that level of consciousness begins to manifest in the relationship as well. And it starts to encourage the client to deepen their awareness of their body. Now, psychophysical therapy is what we call a resource-based model of psychotherapy. And what that really means <clears throat> is the work itself is focused on identifying what new options need to be introduced that will support the person in generating the kind of changes and moving to the kind of place they want to be. So, so much of this work then really depends on the intention of, of the client. So we spend time, time working out what is the goal of the client in therapy. And then the therapeutic process itself is not about particularly the release of emotions or discharge or even processing. Processing is important because it starts to move issues that are stuck. But the real work is about looking for what are the new resources, what are the new options, what are the missing uh, potentials and processes and experiences that the client has. Uh, if they had those, uh, how would they be able to change in the way they want? So a resource is anything that encourages a person to be able to be more conscious, more aware, and more functional in their life and moving towards their goals. So one of the primary resources is the resource of awareness. If you're not aware of something, it is very difficult to change that something. It requires something from the outside coming in to stimulate you or support you in that transformation. So one of the things we're looking for is how do we enhance awareness in a way that supports the introduction of new resources. So Embodiment, or somatic awareness, is the fundamental resource that allows transformation to happen. <clears throat> I think that, I start almost all my talks with this, I think this is, you know, a fundamental description of what happens uh, in the exploration of somatic psychotherapy. And it's basically this, mind and body, oh, we forgot this. There's an E here. Inseparable. Mind and body are mutually influential and interactive. Right? Mind and body really are not separate. separate. Does anybody disagree with that? I think it's a basic fundamental premise in somatic psychology. Mind and body are always connected, always working together. You can't separate them out. It's like separating out milk from the whiteness of milk. They just belong together. Although at any given time, we may focus on the mind aspect. We might focus on the body aspect. In this work, we're continually working back and forth between what is physical and what is psycho-emotional. You want to write these down first? Okay. <clears throat> so we work from this premise that mind and body are inseparable, that they're always functioning together. And that premise leads us then into other things. The body gives form to the mind's story. And conversely, the body then informs the, the mind about the world. So we, when I say stories, really what I'm talking about is all those beliefs, attitudes, uh, impressions, memories, etc. that support our sense of ego-based identity. That's our story. We each will have this story. And we will defend that story. We depend on that story. The trouble is that story also limits us. 
So the idea here is the body gives form to that story. That's what bodies do. Physicality gives form. The good news here is then that becomes an interface between the psychological and the physical. So <clears throat> if, this is the example I was giving last night, um, if you take the form of depression, for example, which would be, everybody just put your papers down for just a second. As you're sitting in the chair, I want you to come back to a memory of a time that you either felt really depressed or really sad. Just bring the memory of it to you. I'll have you shake this off pretty quickly. And I want you to notice what is the tendency in your body? How does your body reorganize when you start to remember a time of sadness or of depression? Sadness and depression are different, but they're similar. Okay, now take a breath and just shake that off. What did you notice happened? How did your body take the form of that memory or of those thoughts? Anybody? Yeah, you tend to come more into flexion or you tend to collapse down. Out of relationships, so you tend to be kind of more kind of focused inward and less able to orient yeah. to the external world. Okay, now come to a memory or a thought about a time when you felt really connected and joyful. It could be connected with another person, an animal, or with something in nature. Don't do anything particularly in your body. Simply just have the thought and notice what your body does with that, with that memory or that thought. Okay, so let's hear, what did you notice? Wanting to take a fuller breath. You wanted to take, you had an impulse to take a fuller breath. Great. Okay. Anybody else? I get a lot more upright and more forward. More forward, more upright. Yeah. So, <clears throat> your body will automatically shift to the form, to, to accommodate the form of whatever your mind is thinking. Conversely, you could experiment with this. Uh, walk around like this for a while. You're going to start going into collapse. I wish I would have known this. I wish... Now I'm feeling sad. I had a friend. <clears throat> he, um, he was a little younger. This is a terrible story. Uh, a little younger than me, a year younger, who had a brother that for a year walked around. I see him walking home from school like this. And nobody did anything. Nobody thought to really intervene. And one day he got a pistol and he killed my friend. He was demonstrating for a whole year the form of a deep inner pain. He also shot their dog and he was going to kill his parents as well. And then he was going to kill himself. Because the story that he was carrying was life was so unbearable that those people that he was close to also shouldn't have to endure that. He was psychotic. And he was in the form of that for a year. We all just thought he was kind of weird. It's a very sad story. Nobody intervened. Had, you know, I mean, as, as a kid, as a 15 year old, I couldn't, wouldn't have known what to do anyway, but as an adult now, if I see that, I would say, this person needs some help. How can I help this person? We tend to, in these places, move away from psychosis and move away from deep pain because it's hurt. it hurts us. Everybody I knew recognized there was something wrong with this kid. Nobody did anything. <clears throat> Which brings us to the next thing. We connect with each other, we entrain and we mirror each other. That is, we get information through space 
about how other people are. And this is the example again I was giving the other night. If you take a cardiac cell and you put it in a Petri dish, and you take another cardiac cell and put it in the same Petri dish but not touching, they will tune into and pulse at the same rate. This is entrainment through the electromagnetic field, and it needs to be this way because the heart, the, the cardiac cells have to function together. You don't want cardiac cells doing their own thing. You just have these random pulsations through the heart muscle. It is the same thing with us. We, you can measure the electromagnetic field off of the body to some distance. And it is thought that actually it goes a very long distance, which is one of the ways that, you know, a mother and a child hundreds of miles apart, or lovers hundred miles apart, will actually feel and sense each other. So, <clears throat> And we also mirror um, our postures and our attitudes. On the plane, I'm not sure what it was, there was this, uh, this young boy and um, his father had the exact same outfits on. <clears throat> they had these yellow hats and these um, khaki shorts and these, I think they were like a reddish or maroonish kind of shirt. And when I got to the airport, there was a whole bunch of them, all dressed the same, and all, all ages, mostly younger guys, all males, and their, apparently their father. Well, this son and his father, they walked exactly the same. They had the same posture. This is not uncommon. <coughs> the son was mirroring the father. There was this physical mirroring of each other. And you will see this. So part of that Part of our connection comes through entrainment, part of it simply comes through our mirror neurons uh, connecting with each other, and the younger person will take on and learn from the postures of the father or the adult. And the adults, of course, <coughs> their body is taking the form of their mind story, so the story, the ego sense of, of identity is getting transferred through postural dynamics that are being mirrored. Because as soon as that child takes the form of that, their psyche has to adjust to that story. This is called psychophysical parallelism. The body and the psyche need to be in some degree of alignment. So information about who you are and your worldview gets transferred through somatically to the child. It's a very interesting thought.